You need a singular voice. It's not about the best voice. It's not about the best food. It's not about the best idea. It's about a consistent, coherent, clear vision. And more often than not, that can only come from one voice because if it's multiple by committee, then the details aren't always purely in sync and then the identity is disjointed. And when it's disjointed, it's not that the customer notices every last detail, but very rarely can the, does the aggregate of all these details amplify into a very tangible, unique experience for the customer. I always say the customer's job is not to be able to illustrate or speak to, this is why it was a great restaurant. They're just supposed to feel it. That's their job. And in order for us to create that feeling, every detail has to be in order, so to speak. And, and that's why you need a very clear vision and identity in order to achieve that. Hey, John, thanks for joining me on the podcast. I appreciate it. Hi, Jake. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. We connected because most hotel people just screw up food and beverage and don't really know what they're doing. So the smart ones talk to people like you for help. And that's how we originally got connected. We didn't end up doing something, but I've always been enamored by everything that you are doing. And I think a, a great place to start would be if you could give everyone a little background about how you came to found LDV and how you got started in hospitality. Sure. But before that, I have to say you did an excellent job with the Delmar. So I think you did the right move across the board. And, and, and it's great that here we are years later still as friends. So I appreciate that, that history together. And I'm hoping to do something together in the future, too, we by will. the way. We will. Um, I always wanted to be in hospitality. As a kid, I was always enamored by specifically the hotel bars. Right? So I, I grew up very close to the Plaza Hotel in the Oak Room, the Oak Bar. And I remember going there with my grandfather to smoke cigars in the Oak Bar. And just, it was this wonderful form, this mix of local New York characters and international tours. They all kind of congregate in these hotel bars. And then that was an image that stuck with me. And I always wanted to be in that environment. It, it wasn't so much a passion for food or beverage. Obviously, I love both. But it really was the environment, the people, the connectivity. And, you know, I, I pursued that. My, my first job was a dishwasher at Haban Pan. And I liked it. And then I got promoted to sandwich maker. And I loved it. I loved the, the speaking with the guests. And I realized that, you know, this was the passion. For me. I went to Cornell to the hotel school. It was great education, but I certainly think that, uh, and as valuable as it is, I think the real life experience is, is uh, you know, is fundamental. Um, after school, I went and worked at the Plaza Hotel. Um, this is in 2002 and three, I did roughly two years as a you know, junior uh, F&B manager and training type. It was a great experience, um, but it was also a reality shock to me in, in some of the challenges, whether it's the union or just being in this environment of a, a great political corporate kind of structure that is merited of, of something as iconic and significant with a hundred year history like the plaza. But I realized that I didn't necessarily have the opportunity there to create or shape a hospitality experience, which was really what I always wanted to do. So at a very young inexperienced, ignorant age with a lot of hubris and cockiness, I would say, I left and started a more entrepreneurial path. What was it about the plaza that you were so enamored with as a little kid? I, it was specifically the Oak Bar, funny enough. And again, it was going there with family early. And, and even I remember, you know, Palm Court Easter brunch, but it was, it was that old world, nostalgic kind of iconic style on the corner of 59th Street, Central Park South, Fifth Avenue. It was just like, to me, it was the center of the universe. It was the center of a, of a dream of a universe. Um, so, yeah, and, and how that kind of tradition and grandeur of yesteryear could exist in a modern sense. I think that that, that, that kind of crossroad uh, of sensibility was very intriguing to me. And is that sensibility something you strive for in your concepts today and what you're building in your company? Yeah, 100%. I mean, the name of our company, LDV, stands for La Dolce Vita, which is this Roman construct from, you know, this glamorous idea of the 1960s, which, of course, probably 
more romanticized in my head than it was in, 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 in the real world. But that's become the ethos and the philosophy of everything that we do, whether nightlife, steak, Italian, anything. We try to speak a, a hospitality vernacular and language of classic, iconic style and hospitality and kind of old world nostalgic warmth adopted and relevant for today's social existence. That's our, that's our approach to everything we touch. What were some of the early lessons that you learned that shaped how you think about creating that hospitality experience. Can you think back on specific instances, not being a guest, but maybe in your career? Well, for better or worse, when I think of that question, what immediately jumps to me is, is my early failures. And I think of you know learning from those failures. Um, the passion for hospitality and the life lessons of hospitality of, I don't believe that service is servile. I think a hospitality environment where we give true dignity to our service level staff, whether it's the busser, the line cook, or the server, and kind of empowering them to, to become the best version of their self and embrace their kind of core identity and then transmit with confidence this love of giving to others. That's a beautiful modern approach to, to service. That again, it's not servile. I think that's an overarching ethos of the beautiful side of the hospitality service industry. The, I always had that innately. I love people. I like connecting with the, the, the interesting immigrants that worked in the plaza back then and, and all the different characters that I've crossed paths with. It was always the people with the, the, the adrenaline rush and the excitement for me. The business lessons learned from those initial failures I mean, there's too many to rattle off. And, 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 you know, if you have a week, I can go through all my failures and, and, and the lessons learned. Like the key with failure is don't be afraid to try, but you have to learn from it and not repeat those mistakes. Um, but I think a lot of restaurants fail because of a lacking identity, lacking capital, and the wrong partnerships. And... You know, the way that I started in, in, in a bar, funny enough, my first uh, entrepreneurial venture was a bar in Midtown Manhattan, and it was very successful. But after that, I had the most extraordinary failure, hopefully, of my lifetime. Um, and all three of those things went so drastically wrong. And I think that, you know, there's this like, it's not atypical for a chef, a restaurant guy, a couple of buddies, let's open a bar, let's open a restaurant. And then you go and you raise money. You know, my first bar was 45 investors. And the first restaurant was 25 investors. But I'm sorry, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, why are you partners with somebody? If you just like each other and you have a bond, that's not good enough of a reason. Like I'm not a chef. I need a chef partner. Maybe I'm a decent business person. So maybe a chef has a need for me. Just because you're friends with someone doesn't mean that you should go into a restaurant together. And, and I think, you know, in part, you see this often in the independent restaurant space. There's lots of dreamers, but you have to ask those fundamental questions. Why are you partnering with somebody? Do you each bring complementary attributes to this business? Is the remuneration and the recognition and the credit appropriate? And to make sure that you have the right kind of balance, because when you don't, it all goes to hell, and we've seen this countless times. How many successful restaurants have imploded because of poor partnership dynamics? So I had that. Uh, I thought it was going to cost me one and a half million dollars. Instead, it cost two and a half million dollars, and you open upside down and, and already in trouble, and that's pretty clear. And then you borrow money at 20%, try to bridge a gap, and then you're just in this pit. And then the lacking identity is a funny thing whereby – when you have multiple partners, it's very, you need a singular voice. It's not about the best voice. It's not about the best food. It's not about the best idea. It's about a consistent, coherent, clear vision. And more often than not, that can only come from one voice because if it's multiple by committee, then the details aren't always purely in sync. And then the identity is disjointed. And when it's disjointed, 
it's not that the customer notices every last detail, but very rarely can the, does the aggregate of all these details amplify into a very tangible, unique experience for the customer. I always say the customer's job is not to be able to illustrate or speak to this is why it was a great restaurant. They're just supposed to feel it. That's their job. And in order for us to create that feeling, every detail has to be in order, so to speak. And and that's why you need a very clear vision and identity in order to achieve that. So I think that those are the three toughest from a business perspective, identity, money, and human relationship. Those are the three things that, that I've definitely, uh, in my initial failures, had a, you know, were, were absolute. And, and, you know, I've tried to address those throughout my career and encourage others to do the same. What are the characteristics that now that you've been through that experience that you look for in a partnership? And how do you find those elements in a human when you're getting to know them or when you're kind of first dating? It's a, it's a great, tough question. Uh, I, I think that humility is, is, is ingredient number one, right? Because all of us, to, to, you have to be a little crazy. You have to have a little ego to want to create in the first place, whether you're the hotel developer or the restaurateur. At the same, because if you don't have that drive and ambition, how are you going to go through this crazy, you know how tough this business is. But at the same time, the humble person, like yourself, a developer who says, you know, a lot of hoteliers, you know, F&B isn't the easiest thing in the world. Therefore, let me, let me do a little research and connect with people that maybe they know how to do it, right? So there's some developers that are the first to tell you, I don't know the restaurant business. I don't want to know the restaurant business. I want to eat in restaurants, pay me my rent, and have a good day. Therein lies something quite humble to have the clarity that, that says, I can't do what you do. At one point, stupidly, I got my general contractor's license in New York City because I thought I could build cheaper if I was the GC. After building 20 restaurants at best at 40% over budget, I realized that I can't touch construction. I'm a failure in construction. And by the way, show me a contractor that can you know, make good pasta. It's like everyone at, at an expert level, you can't be all, a jack of all trades at a high level. So the humility in a partnership that says, this is what Jake does, this is what John does, let's always um, collaborate, let's be free to brainstorm, but let's really respect each other's capacities and, and motivate each other to do their thing at a very high level, that's the dynamic that the relationship needs, I think. And how do you go about setting the tone that I presume you're going to be the visionary in your projects, right? Or are you able, have you found a way to not be that? Or is that not something that you would ever do having experienced failures around lack of vision? I, I think, for, again, for better or worse, we have been successful when I have been able to define the vision of a project singularly. However, and once we built our business to a healthy standpoint, I think by 2018, we finally grew up and, and got to a, a solid foundation after lots of, after, after practically a decade of mistakes. Then with foundation, with clarity, I was able to surround myself with people that I can proudly say in every respective area, they're better than me, right? So have I done their jobs before? More or less, but I've never performed at their level. And therefore, when you surround yourself with an extraordinary team, but the structure of, say, the vision guiding process is clearly defined, it's the chef's food, but at the end of the day, the vision has to come from somewhere. We're able to have a team sport without blurring a vision. And I think that's a tricky game. And it took me, it took me the time to become successful enough to be able to hire and build the right team around me so that in fact, it can be more of a round table collaborative effort, but without ever fully veering off whereby it's never a diluted vision. 
in the past, when I've had celebrity chef partners and nightlife characters, etc., and it's been, you know, tit for tat, and, and, and I'll give you this, but I want this, it's never worked once. Not once. And I didn't say, we're not out to have, we're not here to win awards and have the best restaurants ever. We're proud of what we do. We've won lots of awards. That's fine and dandy. I'm at a point now where I want my team to be passionate about what we're doing. I want us to earn money so that they can participate. You know, we proudly made four of our senior leaders partners this year, and I want them to earn. And, you know, it's a business. So you figured out somehow how to scale this business despite being in a business where failure is common. It is so much based upon emotion and love and passion. How have you figured out how to scale? And by the way, how to scale across the globe. We were just talking before that you were on a round the world trip visiting current and future properties. I'm really curious to know how from an office in New York, you figured out how to do that. For one, you have to focus in order to be able to have geographic scale. So my mistake from 2000, from 2008 through 11, we did great. From 12 through 17, we were a disaster. And it, it's because I was lacking discipline and focus. The international growth to date has all been the Scarpetta brand. I love our other concepts, American Cut. I love all of our nightlife concepts. But we define this kind of recipe where the lead restaurant for an international project is Scarpetta. And then we will create a bar, lounge, cocktail environment nightlife environment to complement it. And therein lies something that's a little less, Scarpetta is certainly not formulaic, but we, we, we have our very definitive, not just DNA, we have procedures and steps of service. With the nightlife, we have our DNA, but we're really tweaking the execution for a respective project. That's allowed us this great balance of creative stimulation, accommodation for a marketplace, tweaking, and growth, right? So it's the perfect balance, I think, of art and commerce. And again, it took us time to focus and define that. Once you have that, a lot of it's the bet on geography and again, the people. So there's where I failed. And, and before that, I, I failed. I failed in Atlanta, Georgia. I failed in Philadelphia. I had a rocky road, albeit in the end, we made money in Atlantic City. I failed in uh, suburban New Jersey. But in New York, in Miami, in Las Vegas, in London, we've done very well. So I realized that what we do, we perform best in cosmopolitan, somewhat transient environments. I look at Atlanta, we were in Buckhead, which is a very affluent kind of suburban environment. There's a lot of money and there's a lot of class in Buckhead, there's no doubt. But Buckhead should proudly say that they are community-centric first with restaurants. And there's a reason that virtually every New Yorker that ever went down to Atlanta failed. And I knew that. And I should have listened to that because the reality is the locals want to support local. And that's beautiful. It really is. In London, in Tokyo, these are markets where people from all over the world kind of come and congregate to be in that specific energy or character trait of a respected marketplace. And frankly, there's a lot bigger mix of people. So, so it's, a, it's just a better fit for us, if that makes sense. So now staying disciplined to that, making the right geographic location-centric decisions, again, makes it easier. Um, in terms of betting on people, we're opening in Rio de Janeiro in a Four Seasons Hotel. I think if you ask me, Four Seasons culturally has the most strong, unique, identifiable, executed, this is our world. This is our style of service. You know you're in a Four Seasons property. I think that we're good at making our magic, but I believe that the Four Seasons is a more capable operator than we are. Those that create, those that operate, it's not always the same skill set, and they've proven to be amongst the best operators in the world. Why don't they do it in-house? Because maybe they're a little too regimented in their approach. And that's why they seek the third party with a story and a name to create a little bit of angel dust and 
But at the end of the day, I believe we found the correct operating partner in the world-renowned Four Seasons to help operate in that geography that we're excited to be a part of and believe. As opposed to trying to go to Brazil, sign a freestanding lease just because I like Ipanema Beach and I went to Carnival when I was 25 (laughs) and just making a go of it, right? That doesn't work. So with a lot of it, we actually were scaling the brand through a finite, more narrow scope that's predicated. Our scope is design, training, marketing. We do not do construction, business administration, HR, accounting, taxes. It's all this other stuff that the customer never sees. That's an effort. Without that stuff being perfect, you don't have an opportunity to be in the magic making business. So if you want all the money, then you have to do all that stuff. I don't want all the money. I just want to have a great restaurant in Brazil and make a humble sum of money. So the right relationship again with the partner pair with the right geography and the right focus that's becoming our recipe towards scale. So I want to dig into that one a little bit because I was at a four seasons in new Orleans and they partnered with a local chef. And I think during the period from 2012 to maybe 2017, you were probably shown some of the greatest real estate projects that were going to be built during that cycle. And it was all very exciting. And a lot of restaurant guys did leases, they did management agreements, they did consulting agreements, but all these deals kind of got effed up and no one seemed to have a good recipe. But when I talked to Four Seasons, they said, we're starting to focus on these consulting agreements. So I'd love to kind of unpack how you found the best way to narrow your focus while also giving the hotel what they want and ensuring this amazing execution in some of the hospitality deals that you're doing within a hotel. Uh, For me, um, there's two distinct worlds, right? There's New York and Miami, which are effectively home where we understand that all of the business administration we can do so my preference in New York and Miami is actually to sign a lease. I don't want to do construction, but sign a lease and do everything and then make the upside for doing everything, right? So in New York, especially New York, we don't have to only do Scarpetta. We're doing a seafood version of Scarpetta. We're doing a new concept we want to do. We'll do, I don't want to say anything, but New York, did, you know, when they say location, 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 New York is the location where we can act and we should. Miami, to a lesser degree, but again, there's a there's a comfort zone in Miami. We have an office in Miami. Abroad, with Four Seasons, we don't have a consulting agreement per se. Um, it, that happens to be a pure license agreement specific for the Scarpetta brand. Plus, we're creating a, a, a bi-level social nightlife lounge for them, pool deck, etc. Um, and in the tri-party agreement between us, ownership, and the hotel, and it takes a year to make the agreement because it is so complex with all the relationships, we ultimately have a very active role and say, starting with the design, right? And the design is so fundamental to not just the functionality of how it works, but how does it feel and what's the story that you're telling? So I think that Again, going back to vision on a broad scope, us taking the lead on the vision, us defining the menu, us hiring the executive chef, us hiring the executive, you know, the GM, doing on-site training in New York, us committing to sending an army down there for the first three plus months to operate our way. And then even when our expenses are reimbursed. We still, as a group, we were always going down. We, always, we proudly put more bodies on the ground than as noted in the contract because we feel that that's how we can contribute. So much so that some of the hotels tell us to get out of their way. Um, Reputation is happy, everything. We're happy to do so if, if the product's there. But if not, you know, we have to push it. So if I'm a Four Seasons operator, what I would never do in a, in a hotel of that caliber, it's very tricky to lease out, to do a master lease of F&B. In a four-star property, I think that you can, right? And I think that the tricky part is there, there are only so many restaurant operators that can do 
the sexy destination restaurant, the utilitarian three meal period cafe, the sexy lobby bar and or nightlife, and the boring, but all the profit is in the banquets, right? So we can say that we can do that, but it took us 20 years to get that far, right? Four Seasons would never give the keys to the castle, master lease. I'm going to do whatever I want as an operator. But we also have to maintain our integrity that says, okay, Four Seasons, you still, you guys, Four Seasons also has the strongest management agreements with ownership in anyone in this industry. We need strong license and or management agreements for the same reason that says these are the purveyors, this is our brand, this is how we execute. And what's funny is with every single deal, we revisit our templates for the various respective agreements on a very granular level and then also beef up the rider to explicitly detail in the line level, here's a hotel GM and here's our, our, our brand project manager for this project. This is how this relationship works. Because the easiest thing is for me and our COO general counsel to make a deal with the hotel owner, and right? But if the boots on the ground aren't fully in sync over responsibilities and scope, it all gets quite political and sloppy, and that, that doesn't serve anyone's purpose. Um, so I think the broad stroke of identity, marketing, and the core program has to come from us. The day-to-day -day execution has to come from a capable hotel operator in, in this international license agreement. But the details of the agreement and most of all the communication amongst all parties on the ground and in the office has to be explicit so that people are respectful of respective roles. You talked about how important the design is and you focus on that first once the contract details are nailed down. One of the little subtle things that we've been trying to do in, in some of our restaurants is almost build the whole restaurant around the bar. What are the little tipping point moments that you've seen in restaurant design, both in the like hardware, how it's programmed and set up, and in the soft stuff that you won't deviate from in your new projects? The I'll tell you a tough lesson. So I, one thing I said I would never deviate from is take Scarpetta. Scarpetta is at its core a New York restaurant. So everywhere we go, it's a New York centric restaurant adopted for a marketplace. So what's a New York restaurant? You go through the bustling bar, you, the bar energy fuels into a dining room. And we like this kind of open format perimeter banquettes with an open flow in the middle where every, all the energy is facing in and the customers are the color. That's what I love. That's Scarpetta. That's also American Cut. That's our, that's our recipe. That's New York as a restaurant. But in London, no one wants to sit in the middle of a dining room. They want to sit with their back against the banquette. So after opening with the exact same design that we use in New York at the, at the Bulgari in London, we ended up modifying a floor plan so that the central core could be a little bit more intimate. Um, then we applied the same logic to Doha, Qatar. And, and, and it, it's funny how finding the balance, Scarpetta has to have communal energy. That's what makes it define Scarpetta, a modern Italian dinner party. Okay. It's not a dinner party if it's a stuffy, boring thing and it's just you and your wife talking with each other and you don't feel the energy of anyone else, right? It's not a dinner if it's just a DJ and fist pumping. That's a nightclub. We need the communal energy. And that has to be a real thing. At the same time, you also can't alienate a guest. So therein lies this kind of interesting balance of how do people sit in a respective market is obviously fundamental. Um, that's one. Having the bar, to your point, we're no good in an environment where there's no bar and there's no energy because it's not what we do. Right? Cuisine is a major component of what we do but we still have to have that. So we've just opened in Japan. Japan, we're doing a five and seven course tasting menu only, and it really is the most fine dining restaurant we've ever done, but you still have to walk through that bar. The bar is non-negotiable for us. We're opening in Rome. In Italy, there's no bars in restaurants. It's not part of their culture, right? You sit down and maybe if anything, there's a petite little service bar. You go to a coffee bar in the morning is their definition of a bar. In a proper restaurant, there's no bar for a customer to stand up and have a drink. 
we divided the restaurant into four rooms and made the biggest room the bar area because by definition, certainly to an Italian mentality, Scarpetta is a New York restaurant and I want to push every last Roman to dine in our bar area. So we made it the biggest, best environment because now we're offering them something unique. So I don't mean to take your idea, but the bar identity is fundamental to us without a doubt. The idea of cultivating a seating arrangement conducive to communal energy is fundamental, but also finding a balance of, of, of the customer expectation, something you have to do because if you're not flexible there, then you know it's, it's, it's just not going to work. What's funny is design encompasses so many layers, but everything we've just said, both you and I, all revolves around the plan. But the truth is the plan is by far the most important factor in creating a feeling. Because we always think, oh, it's all about the pasta. It's all about the lights. It's, a restaurant's all about people. So in the restaurants that we do, it's all about the people. So how are the people going to engage? That's the design effort. And that's the tough part. The fun stuff is picking out the color of the banquettes and the vinyl versus the leather and going through all that details. And that's stuff that, you know, we have a, we have a design vernacular and language of, of kind of natural organic materials. And we like to put them together in a relatively minimalist, contemporary, modern fashion. Um, but we're always working with new materiality, and I think that that's exciting. Uh, and then I'll just say one one controversial note. What we will never do is play in the insta-vile world of gimmick for the purpose of overstated, indulgent shit show to garner likes on Instagram. Part of my language. I got excited. But I think that you so many people... as much as you want in here. So... <laughs> That, but I mean, you know, I live in South Florida. Okay. You come to Miami all the time. That is a huge part now of the identity of Miami. And I'm curious as to, is that a new evolution of restaurant or is that just a big fad that's going to blow up? Or maybe did it always exist for the past, you know, 20 years? I think there's been a major shift. I think that the way we engage with nightlife has really changed, more so in New York than Miami. New York barely has nightclubs anymore. You have a few of these mega festival environments like a Brooklyn Mirage doing 3,000 people on a Sunday. But the nightclubs that I grew up with don't exist. And now a lot of old, older nightlife guys have kind of gone into this restaurant where effectively, yes, they're serving food, but it's taken the place of the nightclub experience. I'm not knocking those places. Sometimes I like to go to them. It's not what we do. Then we're not going to do it. And even if that makes us a little boring, I, it's just, it's not what we do. And I, I think it's more than a fat that sizzles out after a month. I think a lot of these places, just like a lot of nightclubs are hot until they're not. But I think the idea of maximalism and color and all this stuff, the theatrics of it, I think it's here and it's been here for a minute. and. You know, the ones that do it well, Dubai even more so than Miami. It's just, it's it's restaurant meets nightclub meets human theater. There are some principles there that are very powerful. But if you ask me, you know, outside of, I like our restaurants in Miami, Dolce, Scarpetta, et cetera. But if you say, okay, you go with your family, where do you want to go out in Miami? I, I find myself going to three places. Mandolin, Cipriani, and Casa Tua. And it's funny because they've all been there for more than a minute. They're all understated and they're elegant by definition of refinement. And you still have all the colors of the Miami characters and they're still, they're still alive and you can still get all the interesting, again, colorful Miami. But I feel good in those environments. And the other gimmicky kind of thing, maybe you go once to check it out, but do you go back to it? And again, everyone's different. And I'm not, I don't mean to sound judgmental. It's just, there will always be a place as we start about the ethos and the philosophy and then the kind of old world classic style never goes out period might not be the hottest thing but it's always consistent and it's always there all three of those places make you feel like it's your neighborhood spot but these are the hottest best most popular restaurants in miami two out of the three now really have these private members clubs which is becoming more popular in New York and probably taking over the nightclubs. And it's a really interesting business model because you get a lot of your overhead covered by the membership costs. What 
are you doing in that space, if anything? So with, with my actual, my, my capital partners, that are, are, are Miami-based real estate developers, and, and we're all, we're actually developing a members club in Miami. I think it'll be about two years to open uh, on the beach. And it's going to be just that. We're going to have two public facing restaurants, one private members restaurant, private members lounge, and all the amenity spaces from spa to private office um, and entertainment kind of film room, et cetera. So I think that the members club model, now that is not a fad, that, that's an evolution, right? It's been, they've been doing it in London for the last hundred years and it's fundamentally the foundation of much of their social life in London. And I think that in our own way between New York, Miami, probably every other American city, it's going to happen and it's, it's going to be a real thing. I think that we need to be clear on the definition and the difference between a, a member's restaurant and the, re, the fulsome club, right? So if you talk about Cipriani, what they built in New York, Casa Cipriani, is nothing short of extraordinary. It's a freestanding, beautiful building plus hotel plus spa plus deck plus jazz plus restaurant. I mean, it's all there. That's a real club. The Bath Club in Miami it's a real club facility. Some of the others, you know, just provide access. And I think the question is, what's the value for that access, right? So if you do a member's restaurant or lounge for a modest price, and it's really just about exclusivity, let's call it like it is, right? And charge a reasonable amount for it. The dangerous thing will be when you want to charge real club dues for something that is just providing access and not the amenity. And that's the gray that, in my opinion, long term will 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 cause a little bit of confusion, disdain and, and won't win because it'll be off putting to some people. Uh, and then it'll make them question the members world. So I think that that's, I guess my point is that there is a value proposition that has to be respected. If you're going to charge, be a full blown, proper, the new urban form of a country club with all the amenity and community. Or if it's just about exclusivity, keep it modest and just call it a private restaurant. I think you're right. And part of that, part of that is opening, you know, for breakfast. Cause a lot of these places, some of them are just dinner. Some of them are lunch and dinner. But what you said the modern country club or the urban country club, whatever you want to do, that is the place that's having the power breakfast that someone's staying for a meeting. A lot of these places are just that restaurants. And I think that's another unique differentiator there as well. It's, it's a great point because breakfast goes back to real community, real connectivity. That's a club club. As opposed to the new form of a nightclub. Exactly. I want to turn to Rome. Uh, this is really fascinating because your company is called LDV, La Dolce Vita. Okay. You are the best dressed guy I know. You are one of the most humble people. And I know how true to form and vision you are in everything that I've seen. So I can't imagine the level of attention to detail and also heartache and struggle you went through designing a restaurant in Rome. Design is fun. Opening is, is the heartache. And right now I'll tell you, because so we're, we're, we're set to formally open May 3rd. I have never been more scared of anything in my life. Never. Now I think I've been, born, bred, and practicing this moment for the last 42 years I've been on this earth. But with that, and with that, I know that market. I know it intimately well. I know the details of that city. I know the people. I know the mentality. I love it. I intend to move there the day, 10 years from now, the day my eight-year-old daughter goes to college. I spend half my time there. But with that, I know the challenges of it. And it's very intimidating. And it's it's going to be a very tough one. Um so I'm excited, but I'm, but I'm scared. And I think that that's scared as opposed to being cocky. Like when I went and failed and opened in Atlanta, um, 
that's going to instill in us this extra push of details. And it's funny, license deal or not, we still have to, you still have to show up in this business to make it work. There's no free check and roll. That's for certain. And for me, for my team, for my GM of Scrapet in New York, who, who grew up one mile from where this restaurant's opening, to your point, LDV, La Dolce Vita, happened on this very street of Via Veneto in the 60s, and we named our company out of it, and, and now we're opening on that street. This is our Super Bowl. Um, and again, it goes back to the humility to pay attention and make very explicit decisions on, on strategy to overcome our challenges. So if, you, if you'd like, I can elaborate on how we're tweaking it. Would that be helpful? Yeah, I want you to. Absolutely. So Romans give Americans uh, credit for one food group, which is steak. They care about provenance. They care about heritage. And American beef in the New York City steakhouse, going back to Delmonico's, they respect our tradition of that. So in addition, they very much like cozy, intimate, slightly anglicized environments. And what I mean by that is the way that we tweak Scarpetta for Rome is we're calling it Scarpetta NYC as opposed to just Scarpetta. So we're owning our New York identity. If you ask the Roman, what is a New York restaurant? They will say a steakhouse, right? Because that's how they associate us. Um, and I say that Scarpetta NYC is if Scarpetta and Polo Bar had a baby, Ralph Lauren's more country clubby, intimate restaurant, a little bit more maximalist design approach with a great burger and a great shrimp cocktail and a great iceberg wedge. And for entrees, we're serving all of the exact same cuts of meat that we serve in our steakhouse American cut. Sourced from the same cattle ranchers, and we're going to celebrate six or seven chops of the best American beef. And therein lies this harmony whereby, for the Romans, we are a form of a New York steakhouse. For the international tourists, for which the largest tourism group demographic in America in, in, in Rome is American, we will offer them a modern approach to Italian cuisine, not Roman cuisine. And therefore, if you want an authentic Roman restaurant, go to all of my favorites. In Matriciano, Almoro, Danilo, there's, there's, there's a thousand of them doing real cacio pepe, not the fake cacio pepe that you find in New York, doing real matriciana, doing all the Roman classics, of which we do zero of that, because it would almost be offensive if we did that. So as you know, you know, Italy is a regional place that was only assembled in the past 150 years. We don't do Roman food. We take little moments from Stromboli, which is our bread basket that comes from Sicily, or from Polenta that comes all the way from the north in Venice, and we put it all on the table in a very, in, in our heartfelt contemporary fashion. So the long story long is we are New York City for the Romans and we are Italy for the tourists. And therein lies this combination where hopefully we'll get a bit of both in an environment that's distinctly New York. In Italy, restaurants have the lights all the way up and there's no music. We're going to turn the lights all the way down and we're going to play James Brown and Lionel Richie and all the feel-good Americana that the Romans love and give the environment that the beautiful Dallas housewife with the big blonde hair that has nowhere to go in Rome, we're going to let her put on her emerald dress, big hair, and have her Dolce Vita night out. So that's Scarpetta NYC. And then on the roof, we have a nightclub similar to our, you know, our format again of the live music. And, and we're not going to do the Euro scene with the techno and the, and the, and the sparklers and all the crap mature, proper cocktail lounge, but again, kind of, you know, where British rock meets American R&B and soul from the 70s and the kind of this old throwback, gritty, soulful, sexy Americana, not the modern Euro trash techno nightclub. What's a proper nightclub or what's a proper cocktail lounge today? What does that mean to you from a cocktail perspective? In terms of the drinks itself, you know, look, our, our best 
our, our signature dish is spaghetti, tomato, and basil, spaghetti pomodoro. It doesn't get any more simple than that, but we put a lot of love to do it right. So we take great pride um, in doing the classics with real ingredients done right. Right? It's not, it's not, we're not into the gimmicky molecular anything, not gastronomy nor, nor mixology. But I think that there is, um, and more and more, it's exciting. I think, I think as consumers, we've been blessed to have over the past 20 years, a great evolution of quality craft cocktail culture. Um, so we bring that effort of, there is an aspect of bringing the kitchen to the bar by virtue of serious ingredients and, and respecting the composition of it. Um, at the same time, we're not chasing Instagram pictures and, and, and gimmick. So if we're going to do the Negroni, then, you know, do a proper Negroni. And maybe you make it barrel-aged and, 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 you know, with oak to impart extra flavor. But it's still, at the end of the day, the Negroni. I think the environment, again, less hard techno party with sparklers, more for people sitting and talking. And if somebody is so inclined to kind of shimmy shimmy or get up and dance their seat, they're doing that. But it's not a dance floor in the middle of the room. And, and you know, it's not a light show. It, it's a sultry, comfortable, mature lounge environment that's at best from 10, 11 p.m. after dinner until one in the morning. Going back to the restaurant, you know, what actually comes to mind is also Ralph's in Paris, where they took this American iconic restaurant, but I've actually never even been to the one in NYC. The one in Paris has all of the spirit of America with the polish of France and that level of service that you can only find in Paris. And every so often they sprinkle in those little French dishes. And honestly, the majority of the restaurant is all local. So when you were working with your chef for Scarpetta NYC in Rome. Did you approach that differently because I'm sure it's an Italian guy that lives there and gave him a little bit more latitude or freedom? Or did you approach it like Scarpetta Doha and maybe there's more involvement from your corporate team? Um, Ralph's is a great reference point. And it is obviously it's in the right location and it's fascinating what a hit it's been with like this dream demographic of I mean, think about it. There's nothing more aspirational than Parisian aristocracy, right? And they killed it. And I think that that's, that's the benchmark to aspire to. Um, our executive chef and partner, Jorge Espinosa of Scarpetta, he does the menu, period. It's his menu. It's he and I sitting there saying, I want our American cut program. That's the entrees. And then the approach to Italian, again, can't be a Roman restaurant. But what we get to use all of our, Doha is particular because the reality of the Middle East is it's an imported product. Tokyo and Rome, frankly, it's the same approach. Working with the local chef on sourcing the best seasonal local ingredients to enhance what we're doing, right? So in New York, the Roman artichokes, the puntarelle, the fior di zucca, the zucchini flowers, there's all of these quintessentially Roman vegetables that in season are the best to me. It's like, it's like the best thing in the world. Same thing we find different ingredients in Japan. So we allow the local chef to really educate our team on those ingredients and on the local preparation, and then participate in the tweaking of those local delicacies, if you will, to make it speak the, speak the Scarpetta language. Versus Doha, that the local, for better or worse, it's all imported, so therefore we may as well just bang on a recipe. So everything that we do is collaborative. But there still has to be a leader. And, you know, from a culinary perspective, that's Chef Jorge. What has helped you cope with the fear of opening this restaurant? Nothing. I just keep keep showing up. Show up for the, uh, in a week I go just to adjust the lights. You know, they want three people there on April 7th. Let's send six. They hire a PR firm. Absent, separate of that, I'll hire on retainer on our own money, uh, kind of a brand ambassador. Uh, you know, put forth extra. All we can do is put forth the effort. 
I don't know if you can ever cope with the fear. All you can do is act. And again, if we fail, I can I can't find peace with that, but I know that we put forth the effort. We didn't dial it in, right? At some point you realize restaurant has to be a passion, otherwise it'll never work. A transactional, a transactional, a purely transactional restaurant will never work. Not, not at a high level, perhaps at some aspect of formulaic quick service. So the best thing we can do is, is, is put forth that effort. A traditional Roman restaurant, you know, the uniforms are about the same quality as the lighting. It's just terrible, right? It's like a white shirt with a, a little apron. What are you doing from uh, that standpoint to differentiate? In theme with the restaurant, it's a little bit, you know, by virtue of steak, it's already a little bit more abundant and maximalist, right? So we did these kind of tailored brown suiting for the team that's a little bit more opulent than our typical minimalist approach. Uh, so it's definitely, um, without being gimmick, it's, it, it's more. It's more. The beauty of Italian is it's Italian construction and, you know, you can go now to, you know, you can, you can, you can source better product if you want. The problem with the Roman restaurant is the old school Roman restaurateurs, a restaurant is food and that's it. And they're charming in their grumpiness, but why would you spend money on a fancy uniform and a music soundtrack at the end of the day if your, your sole mission in life is to, to sell the trilogy that is the three most important Roman pastas? <laughs> if that's your calling, focus on the pasta. And that's why those are my favorite restaurants. My favorite restaurant in the world is the most classic, boring, no lighting Roman restaurant. Il Matriciano. Best. Go to the same waiter. I order the same thing. In season, fior di zucca, grincia for pasta, and the, and the, which, which is, which is cacio pepe plus the guanciale. And, and I like the cotoletta, the veal milanese. Fior di zucca, grincia, Neil Milanese. That's my dream. That's my favorite. Dream. So did you consult the waiter there on some of your fears and concerns about opening? No, he told me I'm fucked. He said, what are you doing opening in this city? It's one thing to come here as everybody's favorite American customer. How dare you think that you're going to open a restaurant in my town? Welcome to the lion, the original lion's den of the entire world. So that's what he said. Welcome to Hi, Roberto. I've known you for 20 years. Please. And then today... I had good friends and I, I got a picture. I got a text, uh, I don't know, four hours ago of my favorite waiter, Roberto, and, and my, uh, my one of my best friends, uh, daughter and son, they're all there right now having a nice time. So I, I've gone through, I've already cycled through at least round one of the others. You know, provincial is a funny word. Provincial is part beautiful. Community, history. Tradition. Provincial's tough. We don't like to change. I don't care. Rome is eternal. Rome is wonder. Rome is provincial completely. And therefore, I've already taken the lashing of everybody's first impression of who the fuck do you think you are opening here? Then I get past it by being nice and respectful. Now we're going to see what happens when we actually open, and I'm certain that it's going to be a little of this. But I, I, I'm emotionally, at least, if not ready, trying to prepare for tough skin to take it. I want to change my whole summer plans just to go visit your restaurant this summer. <laughs> Good. Good. Please do. This is it. This is it. So I want, to, I want to transition a little bit to the people side and your leadership because part of the challenges of being in hospitality and running a restaurant is the people, finding the team finding the corporate team that you can rely on, what would surprise, I think, the listeners most about your leadership style? I don't know if it's surprising or not, but I'm definitely more trusting of my team now more so than ever and giving them, encouraging them the space to develop as leaders themselves and 
Yes, my vision, but I don't have a shot at the execution without them. So let them, let them breathe and grow, if that makes sense. What kind of people, in your experience, make a good hospitality company? Impassioned, you know, passionate, humble, and, and, and you know, because passion, I think you can break down into hard workers and, and lots of love, and you really have to have both of that. Because just hard work without the love, you're never going to transmit the love and the experience. Just love, but not being willing to sit there in the trenches and grind, you'll never garner the respect of the line level tough workers. Uh, and so it's that hybrid, right? Um, you know when someone's a real restaurant person who's going to be able to have the empathy to really connect with line level staff or not. But it's a thing. A restaurant person's a thing. And I think that if you only have restaurant people, you might be missing an aspect of this kind of hard-nosed business or the, the unwavering uh, dedication to branding and marketing. So you kind of have to have this eclectic mix, if that makes sense. But without pure restaurant people, you'll never have a soulful restaurant. Without real business people that care about money, you'll never have a profitable restaurant. Without diehard marketing people that I don't care if they don't care about restaurants, it's about brand. You'll never be able to stand out in that crowd. So it takes it takes a village of these different type of people to get there. My mentor, uh, English is second language, Korean uh, Korean immigrant. His name is Lenny Chu. He owns Lin, which is a, a really a chain, very successful chain of uh, uh, New York style sandwich shops. He's also a partner in the Milwaukee Bucks, which is quite impressive. And he always says, your job is, is you're a fruit salad container, right? And, and you have mango and all these different flavors of fruit, and you just have to contain the fruit salad. That was my Mr. Uh, yeah. and, and that resonates. How did you find that mentor? I think he found me. We, we had, a, we had a, um, a business relationship in common opening that first bar together. And then he's, uh, we haven't been in business for a long time, but he's ever since then, he's kind of coached me along the way. And, you know, spoke to, he's in Korea right now. I spoke to him this morning, you know, every day. Really? Yeah. Very, very fortunate. And, and it's a fascinating story because he's very much, you know, he, I, 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 I was romantic about hospitality as an immigrant, he said, I'm going to open a deli. And he built a real business. He opened his first location in 1989. Now he has 20 locations in New York and, and three going on 30 in, in, in Seoul, Korea. Um, but he, you know, Cornell was great, provided me a great network, gave me a great confidence to go out and create. Then my whole education life started over with him at 24. And I saw a very tough, you know, feet on the ground, not sky, you know, not pie in the sky. Uh, I, I saw the, 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 the reality of, of the entrepreneurial, very much challenged path. And uh, he's been supportive of me all the way, even, you know, helping us secure bank loans when they were tough to get and, you know, the whole journey. When you're mentoring your own team, do you find yourself doing that in a cafe, in a coffee shop, out and about to kind of transpose like what you're seeing of the world and your vision of the world to them? I think it depends on the um, it depends on the relationship, right? You have a lot of different style relationships. I think that you know. Mentoring a team or simply trying to create a culture that gives dignity to a line level employee, all the romance that I saw at the plaza from age six until age 22 when I worked there, that romance doesn't fuel me at all anymore. I'm not saying it's not there, but it, it doesn't fuel me. This whole thing is the people. It's the people. And the, specifically the people that we get to work with and watching those young careers blossom and grow. Um, 
that's the thrill, that's the high, that's the drug, that's that's what makes you commit to want to stay in this whole thing. And I think part of mentoring others is this is who I am, this is my way, this is my story, this is what I've learned, but it's acknowledging just, you know, different people need different types of guidance. Um, so I think if you put that person first, you can connect with them on a far more fundamental level than if you just say, okay, here, this is my favorite coffee shop and the reason that, that I like this coffee shop is they use seven grams of espresso instead of 21. You know, I, I think it's just like with your kids. I have two daughters, one's eight, one's 11. They're completely different people. So I can be hard-headed. This is the way that John sees the universe and, and, and everything exactly the same with them. Or you can empathetically consider the person on the other side of the table. And I think if you put them first to a degree, you can have far better results. Whether that's your customer, whether that's your daughter, whether that's your server, whether that's the, 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 the your, your, who you're negotiating with on the other side of the table, you know, consider the other's perspective. When you're sitting at one of your restaurants with your wife, your kids, your friends, do you still get that anxiety? Are you still looking around, kind of taking the notes or have you been able to figure out how to relax? It's really sad. I, I don't like going to the restaurants with friends or family. It's like the people that you're most personal with are the ones that you feel the most comfortable with to be in work mode, if that makes sense. If I'm in the restaurant presenting the restaurant or our team to a developer for you know a deal in Madrid, I have a job to do and I'm able to stay focused. If I'm at the restaurant with, you know, Sunday brunch with the kids at the, and I don't, I don't bring them funny enough that all that much, but, and the glass falls and makes the sound, the glass falls and makes a sound every day of my life. I'm going to have PTSD of crashing silverware and glasses in a business meeting. Believe it or not, I'm okay with it because I'm focused when it's just my family. That's what, that's what, sadly when it spirals. So the answer is no, I haven't lost any aspect of that, you know, I do like, to I don't show. know what it is. I get it sometimes too, but then you feel good when everything goes right. But it's like almost the fear of being so vulnerable that the like image that you portray to everyone, including them could easily be broken at any moment and they're going to be there to see it. And what's, what's funny is it's just as a segue, I'm sorry to segue, but, but it's too apropos not to, I think chefs are crazy people and I've had a lot of interesting, tough relationships with a lot of chefs. But if you and I as an owner, creator, operator have that angst, imagine the chef who's really putting his art form at the mercy of the hands of everyone around him to be judged by hundreds of people a day. You talk about vulnerability and the reality is it's always imperfect. There's no perfect restaurant experience. I have, I, you know, the club, maybe La Bernadette, maybe. But it, it's like constant state of vulnerability all day long. And it, 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 yeah, it's, it, it's interesting. But what's funny is when I go out to eat elsewhere, I think I'm the easiest there is. I don't care. I expect it to be a shit show. As long as, as, long as the people, as long as the staff have a good attitude, I don't really care what happens. It's tough. Do you think a chef can ever truly own a successful restaurant for a long period? There's so many different types of restaurants. I think that the mistake that so many chefs make is, think about it, if you, you know that book Outliers and Malcolm Gladwell, you got to have your 10,000 hours to be an expert at something. These guys are that. So to be a shot putter, and the ballerina at the same time, it's virtually impossible. Right? It's virtually impossible. So if you look at historically, take John George is probably the chef, New York centric chef that I respect more than any other. And, you know, he had a, a decades long relationship with Bill Suarez, the guy that I believe to be one of the most savvy, talented, charming restaurateurs ever. So it's literally like, you know, that's the dream team, right? 
the clear hubris of how many Food Network chefs want to go, and, and they, they start with the extraordinary talent, and then King of the Universe, and I did this, and that. It, it's just, you see the joke. And now how many of those guys have restaurants left? The, the failure rate's extraordinary, but so is ego, right? So it's easy as someone without much talent to know that I have to rely on all these other great people. The chef has to be the, the bear and the egomaniac that does the grind to create. But too often, the ego that says they can step out of that and do everything is their hubris. And that's why, you know, we, I think at this juncture, the dining public is not entirely oblivious to the fact that how many of these guys blow up. Therein lies your talent. When you're designing a hotel, when you're building a restaurant, when you're concepting a restaurant, when you're executing a restaurant, I feel like there's always, it's important as the leader to architect a little bit of tension between all the parties. If the chef creates 100% of the menu, it's a disaster, it'll fail. It needs the John Meadow to come in and say, you need to replace this, 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 and this. And these I'll keep. Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar, chaos amongst the ranks, the emperor reigns supreme. I mean, that's an extreme version of it. But it's a t what it is, is it's, it's a team sport. It's a team sport. So I think that, you know, yes, a bit of tension is good, but you know, really what it's needed is a series of checks and balances so that that singular defined vision, which hopefully is all about the customer's enjoyment, can come to fruition. COVID it was crazy for everyone in hospitality. And certainly during this period, I was forced to have tough conversations with investors. And we also found extraordinary opportunities during that time. But I, I would love to know in your business, watching others fail, having some of your own challenges, how have you managed to rebuild again, reinstill investor confidence, maintain relationships despite a challenge or a blow up, which by the way, sometimes you have shitty relationships and those ones can blow up, but I'm more focused on the ones that you maintain during a blow up or a challenging period. How do you do that? I think the key is always communication and transparency. And, and I don't think that people, it's specific to investors, but even with staff, I mean, when you're responsible for other people's well beings at any level, whether it's passive investment or it's their paycheck, the communication is, is fundamental. I think showing your fear and being honest about it and being vulnerable really does lend people a confidence in you that you're caring to do the right thing, right? So I think that this just honesty, transparency, vulnerability, step one. Then proactively communicate. I'm very proud of our collective leadership team, the manner with which through the entire crisis, even to those that are no longer with us, the constant communication. And then when we were wrong about a plan and where this thing was going, we faced that too and acknowledge it and they keep kind of pushing. So I think that that's the most fundamental because let's be honest, everyone was in the same boat. This thing was so extreme that even if you walked into it thinking that you were special, you're going to beat or whatever, I mean, you know, it was the great equalizer, right? Then the silver linings of COVID was it forced it's not just about you know shitty relationships they can go by the wayside. Bad business decisions. You were forced to, to to get out of them. Whether that was the crappy employee that you were afraid to fire, whether that was the the, the a, a, a guaranteed obligation of a restaurant that was doomed because you made a bad bet in Atlanta that I never should have made. We faced all of those realities. And I'm not a hard-nosed business person. You know, you, the PE guys that go in, they buy a company, and then they really look, and, and then they extract the value, and they kill all the... I don't have that. I'm not a killer. I'm just not. But I had no choice. So those two restaurants that we closed that lost money for the last 10 years, one in Midtown Manhattan, one in Atlanta, we would have went chugging along, chugging along, chugging along forever. Now we're forced to close them. 
but we also get government consideration pertaining to helping us clean them up, take care of the staff, etc. One of those locations, now we're a sub-landlord for the first time in my life. I found someone who wants to make a go of it, so now we make a spread on the rent instead of operating a restaurant, which is great. And we came out the other end focused not by virtue of my discipline, by having COVID force me to eliminate distraction, which is beautiful unto its own right, because then with the focus, you're able to scale. And what was your biggest learning during those times? In the end of the day, trust your gut tells you who you want to work with, what restaurant you want to work with, who's the right manager to run with. And when you liberate yourself of distraction and problem and you're left with your core values, people, that restaurant that you love, and all you have to do is focus on that, that's a great place to be at. And now, to a certain degree, we're opening, 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 but now the joke around the office is that I don't even have a job anymore because I don't have these crazy distractions and fires put out. Yes, there's always the next thing, but I'm very much living within my, with focused kind of passion right now. And that's a great feeling. I almost feel guilty because I don't have as much to do. Focus is a beautiful thing. Yeah. It is. You can do but it. With that, it's it hard. frees you, you know, because without the distraction, now you have the freed up time and space to go to Rome to look at the lights. Well, the lights make the restaurant, especially if that's one of your major points of differentiation from everybody else. So get on the plane and go, because I don't have the next meeting about with a lawyer about fighting my way out of some fight. Which is doing nothing for you. Like those fights just suck your energy and add nothing. Terrible. We, we, I mean, I can honestly say that from 2012 to 17, I spent at least 75% of my time on obligations that all I was doing was mitigating or minimizing pain and not actually building anything positive, if that makes sense. So the cause of that, do you attribute mostly to bad partnership, lack of capital? That one was the, the back to the problem of partnership, capital, identity. Where you choose to open a restaurant is very fundamental to the identity. And I think it, 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 if I didn't historically give enough credence or pay enough, enough discipline, mindfulness to say, the reason that Scarpetta works on 29th and Madison is X. If that next location for whatever restaurant, American Cut Dolce, doesn't have any of those similar traits and attributes, now you're already preparing to lose the identity because you're not living true to the identity. So I made poor development decisions, which created poor restaurants, and then with poor struggling restaurants, now all of a sudden you're just minimizing pain and loss as opposed, sorry, as opposed to focusing on what's important and growth. I know you like to travel. It's my favorite thing to do, and that's where I get the majority I know, of... I always see you and your family on Instagram going to all these great places. It's good. It's so good. But you know, following you is fun too. And that's where I get so much inspiration, but I don't do any, like, I don't take notes. I, I take photographs and I just absorb the places that I am and get inspiration from that. Do you do anything special or are you kind of like osmosis like me? You just suck it all in and then you figure out a way to choreograph that in your business. I think it is more the latter. And I think that everyone is, you know, there's different types of people, right? I think that that a restaurant trend or experience, you know, I'm, I'm a very emotional person and I have a very selective memory, I think. If I'm intrigued by something, I can really feel it and absorb it and go back to it. And I think that that's invariably what happens to people like us. If, if that's, you know what I mean? It's, it's the same type of approach. I write down lists and I never look back at those lists of, of, of a creative kind of thing. I don't. But 
to remember places and when having a vision centric dialogue or speaking with a branding person, uh, creating logos, etc., you know, you just start speaking to those reference points. And, and there's no doubt that travel and exposure to other cultures, you know, lends itself beautifully to, to perspectives for hospitality. I ask a traditional closing question to all the guests on the podcast. And I don't know why, but I'm so excited to hear your answer. I'm excited to hear everyone's answer, but yours, um, I think I'm going to be surprised about. So the question is, what is your favorite hotel? What's my favorite hotel in the world? In the world. There's a hotel that I always stay in Naples, Italy, called the Grand Hotel Parkers. And I love that hotel because that's one place that I feel like I'm not coming to my home because vacation is always more exciting than, you know, but it's like my dream home. It's like my fantasy land home. I know the staff there. It's comfortable. It's tried and true. It's iconic old world yesterday. Yet Naples is a city of utter decay and, and beautiful chaos. And it's just, that's a, it's returning to a fantasy home. And that feeling when I walk into that hotel and say hello to the staff and I go there maybe, maybe three or four times a year, even just for one night, I love it. And, and it's a very modest hotel. It's not, it's not, it's not revolutionary. It's not, it's just the feeling of returning to a fantasy home. Most people I know maybe pass through Naples. They drive through Naples. What are you doing in Naples when you go visit? The three things, pizza, sunshine, and clothing. And the clothing transmits to friends and relationships, but that's where all the good tailors are. So we have to go see. Amazing. Well, you're going to have to take me one day. I would love, I would that. love to. I would love to. But you got you to you take no watch and you have to bring a helmet because it's a crazy place. <laughs> I know. But I heard, so our driver there, we were leaving there this, and they wanted to take us to this new pizza place that y- you know the name. It's like a number or something. Concentini e Tristanti. That or 50 Claw. Those are the two. Yes. The first one. The first one. The first one is uh, Ruffini from Montclair just bought into it. He invested 10 million bucks and they're going to start expanding and doing big things. It's pretty special. No doubt. Thanks for coming on the podcast. This was an amazing conversation. Thank you. We'll hope to see you soon. Thank you. Hey, everyone. It's Jake here. Thanks again for joining me on this conversation. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jay Warzak. I'll see you in the next episode. Jake Warzak is the founder and CEO of Dove Hill Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Jake and his guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Dove Hill Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not reflect or represent real estate, financial, or investment advice.